Well, here we are again, ladies and gentlemen, for another episode of the curators answering your questions. And uh, I've copied out a number of the questions. We're getting the questions, obviously, from a number of different sources, mainly off Facebook and the YouTube comments there. So uh, we're not going to be able to answer all of them. And as I've mentioned before, we'll also try and put a lot of them together in one or two other areas. So, for example, people have asked about helmets. We'll do about some helmets and we'll do a little bit as well about uh, what people wear. Maybe we can do rations and some of the other issues that are coming together in a number of questions. But to start the ball rolling, I'm going to start with Chris Williams, who said um, he picked up on the fact that some of our vehicles, when we did the First World War gallery tour, some of the vehicles there had actually been used in the Second World War and taken from the museum. Now, what happened is, Finn, are you going to stand in the way all the time? Sorry about this. Um, but what happened was in the Second World War, 1940, the threat of invasion. So what goes is they decide to take some of the vehicles from the museum and they're used at Lulworth, at Bovington, at a couple of other places where there ended up being static uh, pillboxes equivalent. Uh, and we think maybe that damage on the little willy on the front there was probably caused at that time, perhaps where someone put a hawser through it and dragged it off. Not 100% certain about that. Um, but that led to a question about one of our tanks, a Mark IV, which wasn't in the collection at that time, but it was actually one of these memorial tanks at HMS Excellent in Portsmouth. There's a place in Portsmouth, so obviously Portsmouth is where the Navy trains. In the First World War, they were looking to train the gunners uh, for the new tanks. And what they thought about was this idea that uh, um, if we, where do we go to find people who are used to firing from a moving platform? Well, the Navy, of course, they're the obvious ones. And so they went to Whale Island and it was the Navy that trains the first gunners who are going to operate on tanks. And in actual fact, overall, the Navy at Whale Island trained 136 officers and 2,413 men. Now, as a thank you, at the end of the First World War, 1919, lots of tanks were given out as uh, thank yous to towns that had raised money. A whole host of them went around the country. And one Mark IV went to Whale Island, to uh, HMS Excellent, as the, uh, the training establishment there at Whale Island was called. Now, in World War II, that particular Mark IV, Britain was getting so desperate for home defence measures, that Mark IV was... Uh, picked up basically on the site by the Navy. They got, we think, spare parts from other another memorial tank that used to be on South Sea Common, not too far away, and they got that Mark IV going again. And the idea there was that Mark IV was there to be able to patrol the dockyard should an invasion have come. It could have been used, and you'll see they put, even put a little... Uh, little round turret on the top of it with a Lewis machine gun in or a cupola as it were with a Lewis gun in um, again for whether it was to defend itself from low flying aircraft. Now that was actually used in the early years of the war. There's a wonderful account of how uh, one evening I think it kind of got uh, slightly obviously the visibility from driving but uh, it got not so much loss but couldn't quite see where it was going and ended up running over the corner of a of a local doctor's car that was there at the time um, but thankfully never had to be used in uh, real anger and that vehicle which then went back to being a memorial tank was then handed over to the tank museum i've got it down as 1971 it was actually presented to the tank museum so that's our Mark IV that you can see there with its, um, its subsequent history after its service in World War I. It ends up being uh, reactivated in the Second World War just in case it was going to be needed. Um, another question, here's Paul Shrimpton. Um, what's that thermal jacket do on a gun barrel like on a Chieftain? Um, it's as it says it is really, Paul. Um, uh, we think, and again, someone might correct us out here, the Chieftain was probably the first tank to fit a thermal jacket on its barrel, 120 millimeter. And the whole idea there of that um, thermal jacket is to keep the inner barrel of the same temperature, because now those bigger, longer guns, the process means that the actual metalwork is getting thinner. And there's that worry of a gun that length, um, having things like barrel droop, barrel warp, 
and especially when it's been firing because the barrel will inevitably get hot due to the friction of rounds going up it and if you've got the equivalent of something like a chill wind blowing on one side that may cause the metal on that side to chill only takes a fraction and a barrel that long will be slightly getting bent out of centre and those micro millimetres if you can imagine downrange all of a sudden that's going to make a real difference so that was the idea of the thermal jacket being put on tanks to keep it insulated uh, when it's firing at the same temperature they've developed obviously you now get fiberglass ones you've got ones with double insulation in them and there's another element which I believe is coming into play which is also what they call the heat signature of a vehicle if you're looking at a vehicle uh, with infrared cameras. One of the issues there, I'm just going to have to throw the ball for the dog, sorry. There we go. Um, so one of the issues there is going to come back now. Um, you stay there. So one of the issues with um, heat signature for, ve for tanks nowadays is obviously the engine pumps out a lot of heat that will identify the vehicle, but also the barrel if that gets hot. So there's another double element to that thermal insulation it's also going to hide one hopes uh, the signature of the tank as well for the um, the other people who are trying to try find it or identify it so that's what um, we think I think is chiefed in the first one I don't know if anybody out there wanted to uh, see they found some earlier vehicles fitted with uh, barrel shrouds or uh, thermal jackets um, Andrew Shaw next question says why do tanks have horns um, very good question because you were saying you know you think by the time a tank started up um, it's the noise level it's not going to need a horn to try and uh, make people know it's there uh, my gut feeling Andrew is that it's a horn is there really for notification in the sense of peep peep I, I'm about to move off or something like that to communicate with people all around um, just so that something actually draws attention to it rather than off it goes and of course an awful lot of uh, tanks go on the public road certainly in western european nations nato countries etc where they're driving around with rubber track pads on it may even be one of those another one of these weird ones where it's a legal requirement in some countries if you've got a motorized vehicle of some sort but my gut feeling is it's going to be one of these um, just to draw attention to people so they turn around and uh, and end up knowing something's about to either move off or have a look at the tank um, the Freaker 86 asks a question. In the First World War, um, we often go on about, don't we, about that continuous line down the Western Front from Switzerland up to the Channel. And he's asked a very sensible question there. Was there any thought of going behind that line with an amphibious operation? I know subsequently a couple of other people asked, you know, questions along that line. And um, the answer is, yet again, another one of those really interesting stories in the First World War that we yet again sometimes gets overlooked but Operation Hush was planned for an amphibious landing using tanks to go round the back in Belgium of where the German front line was and do an amphibious landing with tanks and troops with air support a very sophisticated potentially combined operation to come ashore at the same time and this was initial ideas actually started quite early in the war but really the operation hush part of it was around the time in the summer of 1917 when Haig is planning what becomes uh, the Passchendaele offensive and the idea there was if the amphibious operation could meet up with the advancing allied troops now we know that the fighting at third battle of Ypres often called Passchendaele bogs down it's not successful so in October of 1917 Operation Hush was officially cancelled but there's images of these massive great big pontoons that they built they were tested in the Thames estuary they'd have two small monitors either side they went through some very rough weather and much to everyone's surprise they uh, rode that out quite well it was actually quite successful these tests and they get a number of rhomboid tanks and put uh, extra spuds on the track so they get better grip they know where they're going to be landing they know there's a seawall there um, the Belgian designer of that seawall is a refugee in France he comes up with the plans that he put together for building that seawall so they know what they're up against they've got the problem of getting over a whole load of seaweed that's uh, encrusted on the seawall the tanks are going to take ramps to drop down and then drive up over those ramps um, so they've thought this through and the tanks are also dragging ashore as they come ashore they're dragging sledges with them 
so they can bring supplies. And it was this was going to be quite a major operation. If you look it up, Operation Hush, it doesn't actually happen, but again, it shows some of the sophistication that was going on and the potential use of armour that, again, we tend to forget about. Amphibious operations, well, it's much later, isn't it? Actually, they're thinking that one through in the First World War as well. Um, those pontoons, by the way, I just wrote down this as a size, just to give you an indication. They were about 550 foot long, or 170 metres. That is a huge, great big landing craft they're taking over there, which they're going to have the tanks on um, to actually go up to this particular beach there that they were looking at. Um, they did a, a, the actual testing they did some of this was at a place called Middlebrook, Middlekirk, I'm sorry to say. Um, and uh, you, anyway, look, look that one up. It's quite an interesting area there. But uh, as I mentioned, that, that, that is one of the things that was thought about and never actually gets to use. Of course, there's uh, other amphibious landings, Gallipoli, etc., but not using armour in the same manner. Next question. Um, Alexander Mobbs asks, was there any attempt at getting a T-34 um, to the Western Allies nations in the Second World War? Uh, yes, there was, and it was successful. Actually, the Americans received a KV-1 and a T-34 in 1943. Britain received one, I think it was just slightly earlier, KV-1 and a T-34. And there was talk of potentially building those tanks in the UK. Ideas, there's paperwork from some of the suggestions and some of the committees that looked at the issues, including changing the armament, you know, could we put a British gun on, that would be easier for ammunition supplies, etc. Um, and there was a technical analysis of these vehicles. We have parts of that T-34 still in the tank museum. Very sadly, after World War II, for whatever reason, it was chopped up, but they kept parts of it, including the gun and the engine. Um, paperwork from the Soviet archives or the Russian archives now has been sent to us which shows what came with those tanks and what the arrangement was. I haven't got access unfortunately to the archives at the moment so I can't tell you any more detail on that. But yes, they were analysed and reports done and again, same in America, off they go to America, Aberdeen Proving Ground and the American reports, I think they may be published online somewhere as well, what the two countries thought of them. So, um, yep, we did look at what the Soviet tanks were. Um, and again, this debate, you know, should we have copied what the Soviets were doing? Of course, there was a whole host, and you can see some of the questions people are coming up with. Um, is it really that good a design for us to change what we're doing ourselves? Where are the advantages on those vehicles? Is there things we could incorporate? I don't think there's any of them going, good grief, we've never thought of that sort of moments. But again, you know, surprisingly, they were pointing out for the KV for having such a big tank, for only having that 76 millimeter gun on, seemed to be, at the time they were looking at that, um, questioning. Um, in the, about that middle period of the war, um, would it fit a 17 pounder or could a 17 pounder been put on the, on the T-34? Um, so again, it wasn't something that was taken up, but it was certainly looked at during the war years. Um, I'm gonna throw the ball again. Finn, drop it. Oh. Um, right, next question, uh, Paul Newick. Uh, why do track adjusters, the round wheels quite often at the front or sometimes at the rear of a tank, why do they have they don't have any sprockets on whereas the drive sprocket does um, well if you look at the engineering on that the idea of the track adjuster it tends to be just a round wheel but it's on a, a floating housing that they can actually um, tighten so as track wears basically what goes along it stretches um, and after a certain amount of time you can tighten so in other words you'll see the wheel uh, the, let's just imagine the idler wheel is at the front of the tank you tighten that wheel up so it stretches forward and takes a slack out the track because you don't want too slack track because it can jump off the sprockets and you've got a big problem on your hand so that idea behind how you're doing that all the time but there will a point will come where you've used up all the opportunity on the bracket to advance that idler wheel so it won't take any more slack you have to take a pin out now all of that as you're doing it you've got some leeway um, but if you imagine you put sprockets on that front idle wheel just as there are on the back those sprockets won't equally mesh into the track because you'll have um, different arrangements whereas if you know that there's only one sprocket having to mesh that's fine it'll always meet the holes in the track if you've got a second one where you won't know where the holes are going to be if you see what I mean is that tracks um, actually 
lengthens and stretches over time so you won't be able to get sprockets on both having said that i've seen sprocketed on both ends on some smaller driving track digging vehicles because the chance there of especially where they've got things like rubberized track etc of them actually going anywhere um, in terms of the stretch is, is pretty minimal or infinitesimal so you can do that um, so it is possible but on a big tank not worth trying to do and again if you've got the drive in one area all you're really doing with the sprocket sprockets is potentially giving another way of to stop that sprocket jumping off or the track jumping off the sprocket as i should say hope that answers that bit um now what do we got to um i'm down to george george asked a question and all i can say is george don't do that um and uh, another question that a number of people have asked is about tanks where do they fit we've talked a little bit about logistics and you, you know we can talk some more about that that really important how do you keep them going but another one of those questions that, that that often comes up and we don't always really answer we don't do in things like tank chats where does a tank fit within its unit and how is a unit structured and really to answer that i'm going to take you through because as you can imagine, different countries at different times have different ways they structure their armoured formation. So I've picked on one particular period, I've picked on a British armoured regiment from the summer of 44, and I'm going to reposition the camera and we're going to look, because I've tried to lay out here for you, um, where a tank would fit within its um, troop, within its squadron, within the regiment, how many there were and how that might be part of a bigger division. So I'm going to pause here while I just position the camera and then we'll have a look at this table. So I know you can't really see me and this is, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but let's have a go at it anyway. But what I've tried to do is as an aid memoir, lay out roughly what works out as a armoured regiment and how that fits in with the division. And I'll, I'll talk you through it, but if I don't know if you can see, um, but I've used, I don't know quite why, I was trying to think of a way of illustrating the point. I haven't got any models. Um, but if we think of that piece of pasta there as one tank, I was trying to explain how it's going to fit in the whole of a regiment so a tank normally commanded by a sergeant sometimes by a young second lieutenant fits in with um i'm missing my other pieces of pasta here sorry should be another piece there will one tank fits in to make four in a troop now as i mentioned i'm talking about a british armored regiment at about the time of uh, the summer in the normandy campaign there were adjustments to this this is not absolutely guaranteed for each regiment out there different regiments did different things but four tanks let's imagine they're shermans make a troop the next layer up that were troop so there's one two three four troops and an admin squadron um, or an admin troop as it's sometimes called they make up what's called a squadron. So those four little troops there with their four tanks in are supported by the admin squadron and the admin squadron or the admin troop, I do apologize. And again, these words are inter interused in uh, different people's accounts are normally supported by three and a half or three, sorry, half tracks, one water bowser, one general service lorry and 12 three tonners. So they are supporting that particular um, oops, troop there that you've got, uh, all the four different troops rather, that's what they're there to immediately support. Now at the squadron level, you've got three squadrons in a regiment. So that lot there make up a squadron and there's A, B and C squadrons and a headquarters squadron. And another thing to remember on A squadron triangle, so you'll see that on the side of the tank sometimes, B squadron a square, on the side of the tank turrets, uh, C salt squadron a circle, and HQ has a diamond on the side. So again, that's another way of identifying what squadron the tank belongs to if they've painted that. Again, not all units use um, that system. But HQ squadron, um, again, is an interesting one because they look after the recce troop, which is then for the regiment has about 11 scout cars let's say Stuart sorry not scout cars Stuart tanks 11 Stuarts it's got the liaison platoon as it's sometimes known which are scout cars normally nine scout cars um, for liaison duties sometimes again backing up with a recce um, it's got an anti-aircraft pl platoon and again early in the Normandy campaign that meant 
Um, it would be eight Crusader anti-aircraft uh, gun tanks. Um, now they were fairly quickly done away with because there was the and the crews reallocated because there was a realization that actually their function just wasn't really necessary because the German Luftwaffe doesn't appear in any numbers. Um, they also look after the administrative platoon, which again, from the headquarters bit as this squadron level, as ministry platoon has six jeeps, three 1500 weight trucks, one water bowser, uh, three ambulance half tracks, two workshop trucks, um, half track ones, and 16 three ton lorries. And again, this is, I'll talk about how the supply works in a moment. Now, those different squadrons have above them the regimental headquarters, which normally has about four Shermans as part of the regimental HQ, a half track and a command car. Sometimes over in the British regiment, it'll be something along the lines of a Humber uh, box body utility vehicle. Um, it also has attached to it a signal troop with three 1500 weight trucks on, um, with um, one three tonner in the signal troop. And it's also got attached to that headquarters, a light aid detachment, which has three 1500 weight trucks, uh, one uh, half track, uh, one sorry, two three tonners, and two scammels or diamond tees for recovery, um, and that in essence makes up the regiment. Now, all told in the regiment, if you look at it from the point of view of uh, hierarchies, I mentioned normally a sergeant. Sometimes it's a lieutenant will then manage a troop. Once you get to a squadron level, it's a major. And overall in the regiment, it's commanded by a lieutenant colonel. And a regiment will have a typical armoured regiment at the time, about 37 officers and 665 other ranks. Um, as I mentioned, just don't forget this is all ideal and uh, it doesn't always work this way because obviously there's, there's replacements going on, not everything's there, not every piece of equipment's working that way. Now, if you come above that level of the regiment so when we use that phrase about a division a division normally has three of these armored regiments in it that make up that it also has three infantry battalions it has four artillery regiments normally two field artillery two anti-tank regiments there and sometimes a, a mortar regiment as well counter mortar fire it's got engineers it's got royal army service corps it's got remi and Royal Army Medical Corps are all part of that division. And when you get to divisional level, you are being commanded by a major general um, and normally a, a British armoured regiment, uh, sorry, a British armoured division at the time is 14,964 men, roughly about 246 Shermans, about 63 Stuarts, and uh, give you an indication about the logistics issue, about 1,309 three-ton vehicles to keep that division going. That's an awful lot of three-tonners. And I mentioned about logistics because sometimes you're reading accounts and it says B echelon, all these different echelons there. So what tends to happen is you call the fighting tanks are actually technically F echelon. They're the ones that actually do the fighting. Immediately behind them comes A echelon vehicles. Now that means that the transport that we're looking up at this level that the transport that's, that comes along with ammunition, fuel and rations for the troops, what's immediately needed in the field, that's A echelon. If the tanks are stopping for a longer period than just a very quick replenishment, the B echelon vehicles, which again is back further back at this level, then come up and they not only carry, carry ammunition, fuel, water, etc., but they've also got that extra kit that the soldiers on the tanks can't carry with them. Maybe it's things more like sleeping bags, tentage. It's got hot food. They've got uh, catering at this level, um, field kitchens, etc., that can come up. So with B Echelon, that's where you get more um, supplies coming up. And again, you'll read in the memoirs where they're all hanging around waiting. And you can imagine in combat situations, we always talk about the fighting tanks, F Echelon, these guys up the front here. Actually, those um, A and B Echelon vehicles, sometimes they had a pretty hairy time of it because they knew that the guys are waiting for fuel, ammunition, food, 
and yet they've got to find them. And uh, you get all these amazing stories of um, these other vehicles getting lost on battlefields, trying to find their guys, and uh, and that relief when they finally find the right unit. Because again, their emphasis is making sure the FH along the tank guy theirs can actually start fighting. Now, I'm not sure how this is going to come out. Whether you can see this, uh, this is really an aid memoir for me. The pastor I thought was a good idea at the time, but I've already lost someone. If I don't rescue it soon, I'm not going to get any tea tonight. So, um, but it was a way of trying to explain how a tank might fit in its wider unit. So, with any luck, and uh, keep the questions coming. We'll have another session and see what else we can answer fairly soon. And thanks very much. We are a charity here at the Tank Museum, so if you can support us, please do. Consider joining our Patreon scheme or becoming a member of the Friends. Any donations will go directly towards the Tank Museum and its activities.